Uh, howdy, everybody. Uh, so my name is Jake Elliott, and um, I'm a video game designer and also experimental musician. Um, and I hang out out in Chicago. Um, and this is a talk about bad video games. Uh, so you know, I, in addition to making video games, uh, I also play a lot of video games. And I think a lot about video games. And I also, actually also teach uh, game design at a couple different universities in Chicago. Um, and I have found like through doing through this teaching and also through um, some other kind of events and places like this at conferences and stuff like that and festivals um, that there's this really interesting set of kind of entry points into the idea of being a game designer um, that all kind of cluster around this idea of video games kind of at their worst. Uh, so uh, or I should say like sort of video games at their most amateur. That's kind of really more what I'm getting at. Um, there are plenty of games that are like totally terrible that I wouldn't talk about as being bad games in this sense. And I'll get into like, kind of, I'll kind of unpack my use of the term bad a little bit more as I go on. Um, so, you know, kind of, I don't want to like have this talk be too structured. Uh, kind of like mostly the process that I'm going to go through is like looking at some bad video games, um, you know, whether they're deliberately bad or not, and sort of kind of anal analyzing them and seeing what kind of lessons or ideas or kind of weird experiences we might pull from the uh, embers of these uh, colossal failures. Um, so, I guess uh, one, of the, one of the reasons that I think bad video games are kind of important um, is that video games as a, form, uh, as a form or as an area of practice or as a culture or a subculture, um, there's a lot of problems with video games in all of those places. Um, they're very, it's a very problematic form. And I think this, this comes from, um, we see those problems, I should uh, uh, articulate some of them. Uh, so video games often have a lot of problems with access. They're very difficult to get into for people who don't sort of grow up with them or who aren't trained in them or who don't have tens or dozens of hours to spend every week on using them. Um, video games are problematic just sort of like economically. They're very expensive to make in a lot of cases. And we have all these narratives about what it takes to make a video game. And we have these kind of culturally uh, delivered ideas that video games take hundreds of people to make. Um, you know, the most recent Bioshock game cost them $200 million. This is more than, like, uh, this is at the scale of the largest Hollywood films, you know. We have all these uh, kind of stories that make it very difficult for people to get into making games. Um, and those problems uh, mostly seem to kind of stem from the fact that video games were born uh, into industry. Unlike other uh, art forms, like something like film, for example, film was born uh, into a culture of kind of experimentation. Uh, artistic experimentation and technical experimentation, both. Um, uh, films were born in a moment when um, patent law was uh, crucially kind of going through some weird shifts, and a lot of early film exploits uh, these kind of weird um, sort of loopholes in patent law. Um, video games, on the other hand, were born at a moment when um, media was all being sort of um, conglomerated. Uh, video games are about as old as like the Clear Channel Corporation, for example. Um, so the video games kind of came up as an art form uh, in this very industrialized, um, very sort of um, uh, um, monolithic kind of period for, for media. Um, and so I think like this, uh, I, that's sort of part of our history as video game designers, as video game players, and as video game enthusiasts um, has delivered unto us uh, like a real anxiety where we feel like video games are always going to be kitsch, right? So what's kitsch? Kitsch is like industrial art, right? Kitsch is stuff like... Um, Sorry, this is kitsch, right? This is Thomas Kincaid. Um, and kitsch is the, the art, the kind of art that happens within, purely within a commercial context, within an industrial context, right? So, and the kind of hallmarks of kitsch are that um, it instantly tells you that it's pleasant. This is pleasant. This is a like, pleasant cabin in the woods. Um, another important hallmark of kitsch is that it instantly tells you how to feel. Uh, there's no ambiguity here about how we should feel about this picture. We should feel cozy about it. Right. Whereas um, other kinds of art making are maybe a bit more amb ambiguous. That's the kind of like way that we've used this term kitsch versus um, sometimes on the other side of that dichotomy is uh, sublime art, or sometimes on the, on the other side of that dichotomy is avant-garde art. Um, different people have talked about it in different ways. Um, and video games, crucially, uh, also kind of depend on the player, the uh, sort of experiencer, the viewer of the art to kind of know how to feel about what's happening on the screen immediately. And this is this. A uh, barrier of, of like sort of um, uh, barrier of experience that I was talking about, where video games rely on this history, on us having spent dozens of hours uh, sort of learning how to operate in this environment. And so, you know, kind of the way that we've evolved this design language about leveraging these kind of past experiences with video games um, has yielded this uh, really kitschy situation. So we have stuff like um, 
we had stuff like this. So this is the most recent Bioshock video game, which is a game about, um, uh, ostensibly, nominally, it's a game about um, abject poverty, it's a game about labor issues, and it's a game about sort of um, institutionalized racism. And so these people are begging for food, and meanwhile the player is like going around digging through the garbage cans and pulling out cakes and health potions and all this shit like that. And so this is um, a part where, or this is a moment where our sort of like industrialized kitschy game design is totally failing us as artists because this world is not talking about, Bioshock, Bioshock Infinite is, is actually not a game about sort of institutionalized racism and stuff. Bioshock um, Infinite is a game about like power fantasies about shooting people and it's a game about strategic management of resources and stuff like that because of this, our sort of reliance on this um, leveraged experience kind of quality of, of game design. Um, so anyway, I'm going to go into a little bit more about Kitsch and stuff a little bit later, but uh, first I want to just kind of dive into looking at some bad video games. And so probably the um, most, one of the earliest recognized colossal failures of video games is this game. Maybe some of y'all have played this game uh, uh, called E.T. for the Atari. So um, this game was developed in 82, like near the end of 82, which I believe is the year that E.T. came out, 81 or 82 or something. So this is like right on the heels of the film. Um, it was designed by, I always forget his name, Howard Scott Warshaw is the designer behind it. And he, he did a few, uh, he did several games for the Atari 2600. Um, probably his most famous is called Yar's Revenge, which is a really good game. And then he immediately followed that with E.T., which is not, not a good game. Um, but he sort of took it on. He, he had just actually, in fact, finished two projects back to back. He'd been working for the last year and a half or so straight um, doing these really ambitious Atari games. And then Steven Spielberg personally said, I want the Yars Revenge guy to do the ET game. And it has to be done in three months because you know, Spielberg is one of these like um, early, mid 80s, like sort of masters of timing. Um, uh, all this other kind of marketing and stuff with the film. George Lucas is another one, right? So, um, so he says, it's got to be out by December. It's got to be out by Christmas, right? And, that, and this was in August. So basically, um, Warshaw had like three months to work on it, and he was totally burned out. He had like just made these two other really ambitious games. Um, but, he, but he thought, you know, this is like an interesting personal challenge. I'm really proud of the work that I've been doing, uh, and I want to like, really challenge myself to, uh, to make this game in three months. Um, and then, you know, sort of famously what happened to it, this is an artist's depiction of what happened to E.T., uh, which is that they, they printed four million copies of this, and they sold about a million of them, uh, which... Uh, if my math is correct, means about three million copies of this game came back to them from the retailers. Um, and as this artist has so clearly depicted, uh, they buried them in the desert in New Mexico, which is what you do with bad games. Uh, you bury them in the desert. So let's take a look at what this game actually looks like. I'm gonna get my sound going. So as you're perhaps getting the sense uh, from this video, uh, this is mostly a game about sort of running around in a panic, being chased by different kinds of authority figures, um, picking up Reese's Pieces. Maybe that's not so clear. That little um, off-green dot is a Reese's Piece. Uh, and after every so many of them you collect, you get a piece of a telephone that you're trying to build. Um, and then eventually you can meet up. I think you meet up with Elliot, and he helps you phone home. Um, <clears throat> so this game was really uh, widely critically panned. Uh, the, the main primary criticisms about this game were that it was like way too difficult. Um, and part of that comes from the fact that it uses, uh, let me see if I can get to a good point in the video. Um, yeah, okay. Sorry. Well, anyway, um, so these, these pits that you fall into, uh, they're these like little ovals. And ET is cut sort of an odd shape. Um, and it's some of those like dark green things are pits and some of them are not. Um, that's kind of problematic. You don't really know what you're avoiding. Another problem is that it uses pixel perfect collision detection. So you might think that just like ET's feet have to get in there for him to fall in, but really literally any part of ET gets anywhere near that pit, you're gonna fall in. 
and it's really frustrating and kind of weird. And you have this levitation power that allows you to levitate out of pits. And uh, so gamers are used to having these powers that they can deploy strategically and learn about how to use. Um, but in this case, the only thing the levitation power does is get you out of pits. And sometimes in a pit, you'll find like a flower and you can revive the flower and then escape. And so it's like, this game was like really kind of confusing for a lot of gamers. They didn't know what to do with it. It was too difficult. Um, the powers weren't being used in the way that they expected them to be used. Um, and so people just, you know, really widely panned it. And then also the um, publisher uh, was uh, way over ambitious about how many copies of this we're going to sell. Um, so there's a, a game designer and critic uh, and theorist named Ian Bogost who writes a lot about this game. Uh, he writes a lot about a lot of different things, but one of his kind of areas of expertise is the Atari 2600. Uh, he co-authored a book with Nick Monfort called Racing the Beam that's kind of a history, practical history, and kind of um, uh, interesting kind of probe into what it's like to develop for the Atari 2600. Um, and so he knows a lot about the 2600. In fact, he, uh, Ian Bogus made a game for the Atari 2600. Let me see if I can find a clip of that real quick. Um, so he made this... Uh, uh, kind of weird art game, uh, not a good clip on YouTube, that's okay. Um, so he made a game called A Slow Year, which he actually programmed for the 2600, and it's this kind of ser uh, set of four, basically, uh, code haik haikus, video game haikus. So you sit and, and uh, drink a cup of coffee is one of them. And you, your input is just to drink this coffee, and you want to wait for it to cool off a little bit. This is the tension whenever you're drinking a cup of coffee, right? You can't drink it too soon because it's too hot, but then if you wait too long, it gets cold. So these are the kind of moments that Bogus is capturing. He's kind of an interesting art, art games designer working with the 2600. And so he has a good perspective on ET, and he says, you know, really, uh, ET is, is not a failure um, as a design. It's a failure of imagination on the part of the players playing this game. Um, because they expected, uh, they expected ET to be using, for example, his levitation power to be powerful. But um, E.T., the extraterrestrial, this is not a movie about a space marine. This is a movie about a space botanist who gets marooned on Earth and doesn't know how to talk to anybody and just wants to phone home. And that's very much what this experience is like. You know, we're sort of bewildered, uh, sort of nerdy, uh, kind of like wandering around. Um, none of our powers really have any purchase in the world. Um, and also, we are interested in flowers. So uh, Bogus says that this is actually a pretty, uh, pretty solid depiction of, of the theme of E.T. and of what it what it might be like to be ET. Um, he also says uh, this is this game is an expression of weakness, not an expression of power. And I think that's really important. You know, that this is a good example for us to look at. So many video games um, are just power fantasies, like I said, like Bioshock. It's just these power fantasies. Um, and there's there's really a lot of other opportunities for expression and exploration in um, uh, what kind of things can we do in video games that are about weakness, about us being vulnerable um, or afraid or confused. Or something. Okay, so I'm gonna move forward a few years to I believe around 1998. Um, let's check out a little bit of this game called Jurassic Park Trespasser. Uh, so I'm actually not gonna use sound for this one. This sounds kind of bogus. Um, so Jurassic Park Trespasser was a video game. Um, obviously it's, it's about Jurassic Park. It's set in the Jurassic Park universe. Um, and this is about another island called Site B, which is not a theme park, but a, rather a research facility. Uh, and you play somebody who gets stranded on this island um, uh, who's voice acted by Minnie Driver, uh, and you're trying to escape the island, basically. Um, so you find dinosaurs, and then I, I think David Attenborough narrates it. It's really kind of a strange game. Um, and for a game that's about, like, dinosaurs, like magically resurrected dinosaurs, there's a curious emphasis in realism uh, in this game. And they mostly emphasize that in terms of uh, physics and these other sort of immersive technologies or immersive techniques about kind of signaling to you where you're at in the world. So let's take a look at some, how some of those work. Um, I'm going to skip ahead a little bit. So for example, in this game, uh, so in most games, if I wanted to pick up this um, sort of strut or whatever, uh, I would approach it and maybe press the F key or the E key or something to pick up this piece of metal. In this game, you hold down your mouse cursor to reach out your arm, and then you have to control your arm independently, and it's super awkward and get it somewhere near where you want it to be, and then press the right mouse button to grab, and then you have to kind of puppet it with the mouse cursor. So it's more like puppetry. It's more like this, supposed to be this sort of like realistic way of being in the world. Um, but it's extremely difficult to operate, and you end up mostly just doing all these really goofy, awkward gestures. And there's also this strong sense of embodiment in this game that was very important to them. And so whenever you look down, of course, you see your cleavage. And that actually becomes really important uh, because you're, there's no health bar. Uh, your health is represented by this heart-shaped tattoo that she has on like, her left breast um, that turns red gradually as you get injured. 
So you have to kind of look down and like keep checking in on your cleavage to just make, make sure that you're not going to die. Um, this is the tutorial section, which is like sort of appropriately extremely long. Um, let's see. Yeah, here, here I picked up a two by four and I'm trying to trying to have some kind of agency in this world. Um, I'll look at a couple other videos. So. Yeah, here's about shooting. So you, you do have to, it's a first person shooter. You do have to like learn how to use guns. Let me see if I can get some sound from this. Eight shots. Heavier than I thought. Keep it steady. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then what you do with those guns, obviously, is you shoot dinosaurs. So, like, this is me trying to shoot a, I don't know, I don't know much about dinosaurs. I think it's a T-Rex. We'll find out. See. Maybe some of y'all dinosaur enthusiasts can help me identify this. Yeah, rifle. Yeah. <laughs> Sort of nonplussed. Sort of, sort of doesn't mind Six. that that's happening. Um, what's that? Oh. <laughs> yeah, he's like kind of really just doesn't care. Um, and then one of my favorite parts of this game is when you die, uh, it lets you inhabit your body for as long as you kind of want to, and you can just sort of see what what happens next. Um, but you have no control, and you're you can move your head, but not any other part of your body. Um, so this is what happens when you get killed, for example, by a velociraptor. Yeah, that's what it looks like when you're dead, the heart. <laughs> yeah. And then, of course, you can do other things besides shooting dinosaurs, like you can pet a yes, dinosaur. Um, Perfect. But you see, and here's the clever part, wouldn't the dinosaur blood be preserved as well? That's really the, the where the real challenge of the game comes up is when you want to pet a dinosaur. That's when it gets really, really hard. Um, uh, so yeah, this game, uh, you know, obviously like they made this commitment to this kind of re realistic physics and sort of immersive user interface stuff. I don't know if you noticed when I was firing the gun, there's no uh, ammo readout either, but she just says like, I think th I think I have like five shots left. Whenever she's, oh wait, I think it was three. I think I have three left. And you have to kind of like try to keep track and hope that she's keeping count pretty well. Some of the guns, actually, she doesn't know how many bullets fit in that gun. Um, and so she just says, like, it feels kind of light. I feel like I'm running low on ammo. So, um, but this kind of interesting sort of dedication to this stuff um, obviously produced what, what we would consider like a really bad video game, um, but also kind of stirred up some interesting design ideas. So like, for example, um, there's this, uh, let me open this up here. Um, there's this small studio in Chicago called uh, Young Horses. And um, they met at DePaul University, um, game design students. And they were really into this game, Trespasser. Uh, it has a sort of cult following. Um, and they made a game called Octodad, uh, where they sort of were inspired by this, this weird interface stuff. Hey, what's up, buddy? And, um, and so this game that they made kind of takes on those weird interface uh, mutations 
and, and uses them as like kind of really deliberate game design techniques. So Octodad is a game about you're an octopus who's pretending to be a human and he has a family and he doesn't want his family to find out that he's not a human. So as in Jurassic Park Trespasser, doing even basic things like picking something up is extremely difficult. But in this case, it's because you have no bones because you're an octopus, right? Um, so here's Octodad, for example, trying to turn off his alarm clock. So it uses this weird directly, kind of weirdly literal interface. So like I have to drag the mouse to move one leg and then drag the right mouse button to move the other leg, right? Kind of, yeah. I kind of hope I can find this. Uh, there's the alarm clock. And nobody notices. Nobody notices. That's the idea, yeah. You got to be, it's a stealth game. So, um, And then if you hit the space bar, you switch out of leg mode into arms mode. And so now I'm kind of just moving this arm through space. And if you hold down the mouse button, I think you can pick stuff up and sort of negotiate it. Right, so this game, um, uh, let me try to move over here a little bit. So this game is really cool, and it's, got, it's been very popular for them. They're working on a sequel to it. This was a free game. They're working on a sequel that's like a commercial release. Um, and it's, it's because of the sort of pioneering work that these really bad game designers, well, I shouldn't call them bad game designers, but these good game designers who made a bad game uh, of Jurassic Park Trespasser kind of uh, uncovered this, some of these really interesting design ideas. And then other people felt free to kind of recuperate them or, or kind of determine them or kind of turn them into sort of interesting design experiments. Um, and it came out of you know, the fact that uh, playing Jurassic Park Trespasser, while it is a sort of bad design, it's a really joyful experience to play it because it's really funny. It's like slapstick. It's like the sort of dissolution of the body. We have all this humor in the 20th century that's like all about the sort of disruption and dissolution of the body of Charlie Chaplin and Buster Keaton, stuff like that, uh, Three Stooges. And we love that stuff. That's really enjoyable for us to play. Um, and it gives, and obviously it can give us some kind of interesting ideas. Um, so let's move on to the next game a few years later. Um, and let me see if I have a good clip of this here. Uh, sorry. Well, here's a picture of it. But um, this is a game called uh, Big Rigs Over the Road Racing. Um, I know I just downloaded a video of it, so let me see if it's in my. Sorry. Yeah, here it is. What's up, everybody? So this is a racing game um, about driving big trucks around. And um, there are a number of problems with this game. But let's take a look at um, like the first few moments of gameplay just to kind of get a, I think they'll be pretty obvious pretty quickly what is wrong with this video game. Let's skip ahead. So there's a few different maps you can choose from. You choose your truck, and then the race begins. Might be kind of hard to see because I know it's kind of bright in here. Um, but so okay, yeah. A couple, couple problems that, that come off uh, come up right off the bat. So for one thing, your opponent, the other truck, does not move at all. So none of, the, none of your competitors in these races actually move. Um, another issue is that there's no collision detection at all. So uh, for example, you can drive through these buildings uh, with no penalty. Uh, I don't know if you saw, because I know the lighting's kind of weird, but in the very beginning, he approached this bridge and then just like drove right through the floor of the bridge. And so to me, this is alarming because like if I were a game designer and I knew that my engine had no collision detection, I don't think I would put a bridge right at the beginning of a race because it just sort of like, so I'm not really sure what the reality of this like situation was where this game actually got put into a box and sold to people at stores. Um, clearly, something, <laughs> clearly something wonderful happened. Um, also, the, um, so actually they made a, an update. So I, like I said, the, the uh, opponents don't actually drive anywhere. They released an update to it, a patch, that fixed that issue. Um, but they weren't able to get the AI. So the trucks would drive with you, but they weren't really able to get the AI good enough for the trucks to actually like, complete a race. Uh, so you st it's still like unlosable, basically, because uh, the other trucks can never make it to the finish line. Um, and the, the uh, yeah, right. Oh yeah, this is another thing that I really like about this game is that it limits your maximum forward speed, but it doesn't limit your maximum reverse speed. They didn't think of doing that. So you can go, you can go infinitely, kind of in reverse as fast as you as fast as you want. Um, yeah, there's. Uh, 
Yeah, it, it, it really, yeah, it doesn't, um, the truck doesn't respond to these turns. It, it just maps it to the surface of the terrain, and it, it maps it to the, like, these like angles, changes in the terrain. And the text is filling out of the boxes. Yeah. yeah, they're all over the all place. Over. Like, as soon as you start playing the game, it's, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, oh, there you go. Zero. I think you just stop. I don't know what. Now, also, the, the back of the box, let's take a look at the back of the box again. Um, um, the back of the box makes a lot of claims. Uh, none of which are borne out, very few of which I should say are borne out by the game. Uh, so like for example, 1,000s of miles of highways and byways across America. Uh, this is not true. <laughs> this is not true. Um, three levels with a variety of wicked challenges, uh, including the ultimate traffic stopper, a police roadblock. Um, there's nothing in that sentence is true. That's, none of that is in the game. Um, and then also like uh, there's this part about how you have to deliver your load to its destination before the competition, uh, keep your tank full, um, and then also like, what does it say, something about avoiding, oh, try to stay one step ahead of the law. So there's like, there's no police in this game, there's no concept of fuel, there's no competition. It's just like all, it's really, really kind of strange. And I mean, so part of the development reality of this game that I, that I know about is that it was originally um, a sort of mini game inside another racing game. And, and then the publisher uh, asked like, you know, could you actually split these apart into two games so we can have two SKUs and hopefully like pick up twice the revenue? Um, but I guess they didn't like really kind of, uh, this one got less attention I guess than the other one that, that was released. Um, there were two developer, two development teams working on this game, uh, both of which kind of deny responsibility for the final product. They kind of sort of both blame the other team. Uh, one of which was this Ukrainian studio that developed the engine and the other was this Californian studio that like I guess did the game design, and you know, frankly, I don't really know who to blame in that case. They're, they both uh, have some shortcomings. Um, so, and, and this, there's another game that's kind of reminiscent of this. I'm gonna see if I can get a clip of it because I actually didn't prepare to talk about it. But, um, let's see. Yeah, have you heard of this game called Desert Bus? Um, this was part of a collection of, I believe, PlayStation One games um, by. Uh, it was Sega Saturn. Yeah, that makes more sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, they were nominally designed by Penn and Teller, the magicians, right? Um, and so this is a game that uh, Desert Bus is a game where you have to um, drive from Tucson to Las Vegas in real time, and it, ta and it takes like eight hours to, to finish this drive in real time. And the road is completely straight because to make it curvy would be like too much fun, possibly. Uh, so the road is completely straight, but the truck steering is messed up, so it kind of drifts. So you have to kind of constantly adjust for it. Um, and then if you get if you uh, act, like go off the road, then you have to get towed. And depending on how far you've gone, that happens in real time too. So you have to wait for the tow truck to come, and then wait for it to drive you the three hours back to Tucson, depending on how far you've gotten. Uh, and so this game is kind of is kind of exciting uh, because of what how it lives within the culture of um, video games uh, because this is uh, this is a this game is kind of mostly used now um, in a this like endurance charity kind of thing. There's this team that like every year does a charity run where they're like we'll play um, Desert Bus for this you know this number of minutes for every dollar that you donate or something. Uh, and so it has this great kind of like place in our culture as video game enthusiasts, as video game players, and as video game designers, uh, that it's kind of like this place that you can go to, Desert Bus, and it's this thing we can all kind of refer to. And it's also this like awesome sort of durational, physical, like endurance kind of performance thing that, that we can use. Um, so yeah, Desert Bus is pretty exciting too. Um, but Desert Bus is a little bit different from, from the other uh, games that we looked at, obviously, because Desert Bus is like kind of bad on purpose, right? So Desert Bus is like um, embracing this idea of bad video game design, thinking about you know, uh, like what are some interesting kind of conceptual art, uh, performance art kind of directions we can go with the idea of bad video games. And really with the idea of like letting go of these sort of industry narratives about what makes a video game, what, you know what I mean? Um, so Penn and Teller are like being performance artists using this kind of form because they are willing to sort of discard notions that they'll have some kind of industry um, uh, value judgment about that. About the, um, so, and there's another group of artists um, that are active now uh, who also are doing this kind of work where they're like letting go of, um, where they're making deliberately bad video games, where they're letting go of, of these like industry approved value systems about what makes a, what makes a game correct or incorrect. Um, and so this is like one site, this website called gloriousTrainwrecks.com. 
is this one site where a lot of these artists um, meet and work. This uh, website's been around since I think like 2008 or 2007 or something like that. Uh, it was founded by Jeremy Penner, a game designer. I believe he's Canadian. I might be wrong about that. Um, and he kind of created it as a place where people could get together and have these like little game jams, uh, making games that are kind of deliberately uh, bad, like deliberately kitschy, um, uh, using kitschy game assets, um, or but also like have this kind of DIY punk kind of um, ethos going on with them, right? Um, this kind of this thing like there's that famous um, illustration in a I forget what the zine, but in some old punk zine, that's it's like a diagram of like two different chords, and it says. Here's one chord, here's another chord, now go start a band. So it's like this sort of embracing the fact that we don't have to be professionals to make this kind of work. We can be folk artists, we can be punk artists, we can deliberately reject the sort of mastery and skill and stuff. And that's what this website is about, Glorious Train Wrecks. So they, um, they host like a lot of these different game jams. I want to show you a couple of them real quick here. Um, yeah. So actually I'll just kind of Go to one here. So their main kind of um, game jam that they have, oh, but game jam is like kind of setting up a time period where like, we're all going to make video games for two hours and then see whatever comes out of it. That's a game jam. It's kind of a popular thing in independent games right now. Um, so their longest running series is Click of the Month Club, and this is a roughly monthly um, event where, like I said, it's like a two hour time period. And I've, been, I've participated in this a few times, and it's really fun because two hours, like you really can't do anything serious in two hours. So you really have to let go of a lot of your preconceptions, and that can be really freeing as an artist. Um, so like, yeah, this one looks like only one uh, participant got into. Usually, usually there's like around between two and seven uh, games in it. Um, a lot of these folks use, uh, actually let me open this up first here. Uh, let's see. Yeah. A lot of the folks who participate in, um, in Glorious Trainwreck stuff use this tool called Click and Play, and that's what where that title, Click of the Month Club, comes from. Has anybody ever used this tool, Click and Play? See any hands? OK, this was um, w what I started out making video games on when I was like 10 or 11 years old. Uh, and it's targeted for children um, to be able to use it to make video games really quickly. Um, I have a screenshot of the interface. Um, so it looks kind of like this. Uh, basically, you have like a scene where you kind of drag your actors into, and it comes with a bunch of clip art. That's one of the things that uh, made it most accessible um, like that's why the the box art just shows like all these different characters kind of streaming out of it because it's like came with all these prefab things for you to play with and recombine it to <laughs> video games as a kid. Um, so you put these characters in the scene and then you can give them these little behaviors that are basically like you you basically just press play and then things happen and then whenever something happens it's like hey whoa fireball collided with this running guy what should we do and you kind of tell it like well destroy the fireball or something like that right so it's just, it's kind of um, really uh, designed in such a way that the child can enter it and like not really have a program in mind, but can just kind of sketch and play out and like reason, start to reason about the world and stuff. So it's really, really a good kind of playful tool because also because playing, uh, designing the game is playing the game. They're not like divorced from one another in this case. You can you know, render it then to a, play, you know, to a format that's not editable, but it's important I think um, as a game design tool for kids that it feel like play when you're doing game design. So. Um, a lot of the folks at Glorious Trainwrecks use this tool, which is now like super old, right? Um, it's now really, what is this window? Sorry, let me get my game up. Um, it's now looks kind of kitschy, uh, and it ha so it has that quality to it. But here's, here's an example of a game made uh, using click and play. Uh, there's some modern tools let you convert click and play games into flash games. So fortunately, click and play itself is really hard to run. You have to get DOS box and install Windows 3.1 on it and then run it in that. But fortunately, um, play this here. So it's using this, you know, prefab like clip art. And these kind of weird mechanics, like this mechanic is like collect lemons but don't touch bananas and listen to this old guy on the bench talk to you about the end of the world. So this is like a really remarkable game. Oh, and then the old ones. Um, this game has a really unusual tone to it, right? It's like, it's like pretty, pretty brave, pretty astonishing. And it was made in two hours for this um, game jam. 
Hey, buddy. Um, and so, yeah, that, so there's like a lot of kind of interesting, weird, exciting activity uh, happening in, uh, sorry, those are my notes, happening on glorious train wrecks, uh, using, you know, kind of reclaiming some of these tools that look kind of kitschy for their kitschiness and for, you know, for their kind of remixability um, and for their kind of like DIY punk sort of like um, ethos attached to them. Um, one designer who's really embraced this way of working is Anna Anthropy, who wrote a book called Rise of the Video Game Zinesters. Uh, and so, yeah, she's a game designer from California um, who, who's like fairly well known in the indie games community um, for, you know, as a, being a really good game designer. And she's also a really good critic of uh, like game design, level design. She has a series of articles um, kind of breaking apart the design decisions in the original Super Mario Brothers that's really interesting. Um, so she's, you know, very smart, um, and, but also kind of like, um, I, I guess like most importantly, at least from my perspective, um, is an important sort of advocate of DIY video game making. And so her uh, sort of embrace of the glorious train wreck site and of these, these communities working there and of these tools that they're using and these processes that they're using and kind of community practices that they're developing um, has become really important. Uh, and and this, so this book that she wrote is like kind of about that movement. She calls it a zinester movement. She talks about video game zinesters. Um, so this is like sort of like the punk zine thing, you know, which is about, um, yeah, uh, it's about handmade stuff, which is about not like, again, like not being attached to these like sort of industrial narratives about quality, um, and also about uh, reappropriation of images. It's like uh, reappropriation of images and music and um, interactions and stuff is really important. Uh, so another game that came out of this um, glorious train wrecks is this one that's called Pretend You're Platforming. So this is a game. <laughs> This is a game where you, you are a, a runner, like a 2D side-scrolling platformer character, but there's no actual gravity. If you just press up, you'll move forever. But there's these platformer game police who will bust you if you do something that doesn't look realistic. And so what you end up having to do is kind of pretend to like ape Mario physics or something, you know? Like, oh, I did that too long. <laughs> Whoops. Um, so, so this game ends up being like a really, a really interesting thing where you're, you're not like, it's not about skill in sort of dexterity, it's about skill in performance and theater in like uh, convincing this um, group of judges that you are obeying the laws of gravity. Um, and this game is a response to another game that somebody made on um, Glorious Trainwrecks where they just, they had a platformer and then at the last minute they were just like, got rid of the gravity and they were like, oh, LOL, this platformer is really weird with no gravity on it. Um, and so this <laughs> designer, you know, like said, oh, there's something really interesting there. You know, I feel like I'm pretending to be a platformer. Yeah, so anyway, that, um, this is, yeah, another game like Octodad that's about pretending about theater and this is like kind of an interesting direction we could go in, in video games a lot more, like, you know, asking the, asking the player to be like an actor or something that it seems like a really fertile uh, area. And, and, and it came up here because of um, these like sort of short turnarounds, uh, you know, because of this like, um, pressure to relinquish uh, a lot of uh, sort of like uh, to relinquish a lot of control over the output. Um, this kind of pressure to be free and sort of playful in the game, not just in the game play, but in the game design practice. Um, and also came from the fact that um, all of these games are like kind of always already remixes. And so this uh, designer felt very comfortable taking an idea from one of his peers and and recreating it into this new kind of game. So um, let's see you. Else did I want to look at? Um, one other game. Yeah, me. Go ahead. So another thing that's kind of interesting about Glorious Trainwrecks, the website, is um, it's like a Drupal wiki kind of site, right? So that means that anybody can post a new node on it who um, has an account, who registers for an account, um, and so that means you know everybody can like organize game jams, and that's been really fruitful. Like uh, just a few days ago, somebody was just like uh, playing around with the Wolfenstein 3D level editor and thought like, oh shit, I bet other people know how to use this, and they just made a new event, and then there's like 15 new Wolfenstein 3D levels from this new game jam. So that was like really cool. It's really um, agile. Um, but uh, the sort of downside of it is that they have a real problem with spam. So these spam bots create game jams um, on their website. So like for example, here's a game jam that was created by the spam bot Medu 539. And the title of this game jam is Aluminum Alloy Die Casting Office Chair, Aluminum Bronze Casting Parts. And then their description of it is just like a bunch of spam garbage. But people actually submitted games to this game jam. They like took this up as like a thing that, you know, they could do. So it was a few of these, um, oops. Let's 
see, yeah, here's another one, shoe trends to produce early planting season. And so this, some of the games that people submitted, like, I don't want to buy your goddamn shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and Shooter, and then this, is, this one is um, by uh, my personal favorite game designer of Glorious Trainwrecks in the time that I've spent with it, um, this person named BC underscore. And I really have no idea who this person is, um, but their stuff is just so fucking weird. <laughs> Um, that I'm really into it. So this is um, BC's game called Bum Charles that he or she made for the, um, for the what was it called? Shoe Trends to Produce Early Planting Season Jam. Um, so let me go ahead and play it here. Uh, like, practically nothing. Uh, <laughs> yeah, one of my favorite aspects of most of BC's games is that the input does not map directly to the output. So, um, like, sometimes they'll do stuff where it's like you press a key and then there's like a three second delay before something happens and it makes something move in the opposite direction. Uh, they keep going back and forth between like mouse controls. Uh, so, like, It'll just be like momentarily I can click on stuff. I don't know. It's just like it's total chaos. Um, what? I don't think I have like an avatar in the traditional sense of the of the word <laughs> video games. Yeah, that's So okay, yeah, yeah. I can kind of control that guy. But it's it's mostly backwards. I can kind of control that guy. So there's also like in click and play, there's these built-in like race car controls and stuff like that. And a lot of, a lot of these designers will use them, like um, apply race car controls to something that doesn't actually rotate or do these other kind of things to like really uh, fuck with your ability to like um, interpret what's happening. Um, so this is, you know, almost like a, like a kind of glitch art or something or like a kind of like um, experimental new media art as much as it is a video game. And, and um, you know, I, I hang out a lot at that intersection and I, I, re I really like that intersection. Um, I, I wanted to like kind of also couch it historically in this other kind of moment in art um, that's that's like not a new media moment but a painting moment which I don't know a whole lot about painting but I um, there is this one uh, sorry so there was this moment in painting that was called bad painting um, and this is a painting by Joan Brown yeah Joan Brown called woman wearing a mask um, and so, yeah, bad painting is a term that was coined by this curator, Marsha Tucker, in a, a show at the New Museum. Um, and it was, it was kind of about, you know, reclaiming the word bad in the same way that I'm reclaiming it to talk about bad video games. Um, you know, it's kind of about, like, embracing, uh, embracing kitsch and abjection and other kinds of ideas like that. Um, not as, like, a sort of, like, terminal point in, in a kind of creative practice, but as, like, a starting point, you know? Um, as like a way to explore some new aesthetics that don't have some of these trappings of, you know, like, because some of these like industrial narratives about quality, like I was saying, can be um, really hostile to new developers and stuff. Um, and they, they're also like, you know, like they're not um, objective. They're coming from a place that's about uh, marketing and the flow of capital and like commoditization and stuff like that. So they, you know, these are not like, like some of these ideas that we, um, that we come up with in order to decide what makes a good, good game and what makes a bad game have very specific agendas that are not necessarily our own agendas. And so these painters that were working in this, um, that were identified retroactively, none of these painters set out to make bad paintings, but they were um, sort of retroactively identified as bad, bad painting painters. Um, uh, but they're doing similar things, I think. Like this, this um, painter, Joan Brown, is um, reclaiming a few different things in this painting. She's re, you know, reclaiming, um, obviously, cuteness, like this kind of cute look. Um, you know, obviously also reclaiming this like nude portraiture thing um, and kind of just, you know, mashing them up and seeing like where, where this can, how this can be like a starting point for uh, a different kind of aesthetic play or something like that. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's all the games that I wanted to show. Um, I did want to kind of go back to this Bioshock thing again. Um, see if I still have that open. 
Yeah, I want to go back to this thing about, about playing Bioshock Infinite, um, which is a $200 million game in which you eat out of the trash can. Um, and, uh, like, I guess, I, again, this, this game is a good example of, uh, like I said, our sort of, like, the way that we sometimes feel kind of imprisoned as game designers into making kitsch. And again, the hallmark of kitsch is that kitsch tells you exactly how to feel. Um, and there's no ambiguity in kitsch. And, and so, like, again, um, the sort of, like, counterpart or the, the sort of, like, opposite of kitsch in this kind of dichotomy uh, we sometimes talk about as being uh, sometimes avant-garde art, but we sometimes talk about it as being sublime art. Um, and there are a lot of, uh, like, game critics who, um, or game critics and also other kinds of critics who have said that video games are not capable of producing sublime art. Uh, for a few different reasons. Um, so one of which is this fact that we're just like wrapped up in, in kitsch. One of which is this fact that we, um, our uh, game designers were born into an industry rather than into like a, a form or into an experiment. Um, so uh, another reason I guess that's given pretty often is this like, I um, mean this philosopher Schopenhauer, uh, is this like sort of romantic philosopher um, who, you know, talks about, talked about the sublime a lot, um, and uh, Schopenhauer said that like uh, the purpose of art is to stop time, right? Um, and so art is about suppressing your will to being, your your will to live for a moment, and, and you know uh, encountering the divine, or what Kant said, um, uh, thinking divine thoughts. This is the sublime art experience. And um, some people like Brian Moriarty is this game designer to me. That game Loom, if you've ever played that, or a bunch of text adventures and stuff too. Um, uh, Brian Moriarty said that video games will always be kitsch. Uh, because they can never stop time, they can never suppress the will to being, because they are themselves all about an expression of will within video games, right? And um, that's, not, that's not true for me uh, at all. In fact, um, I had an encounter with the Sublime um, yesterday while I was playing Big Rig um, Over the Road Racing uh, that I want to share with you now. Um, this, is, this is about a moment when I was playing Big Rig's Racing and I saw the face of God. Oh wait, I gotta turn off that other one first. <laughs> that's that's not very sublime. Okay, here we go. So you can just, in this game, Big Rigs Racing, which is a game about giant trucks racing each other, some of which are able to move and some of which are unable to move, um, you can really just drive out into space and just sort of encounter the infinite. Um, and like I said, you can also reach infinite speeds. 
Uh, and this is a really transcendent, sublime sort of experience to have. And I should add that that music that was playing is the real music in this video game that's about giant trucks racing each other. <laughs> so um, I don't think any of us could say that this is not beautiful or sublime. Oh, thanks. That's all I have.